teaching. And verse 22. If any man loves not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. The word anathema means to be accursed, to be damned, to be destroyed. The word maranatha means the Lord coming. And the statement is that if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, he will be accursed of God. That's a tremendous statement, isn't it? Here's a warning. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, not what he can do for you, but him. Nothing in the Bible about seeking him so he can do something for you, but the scripture enjoins you to seek him for what he is. And here's this statement. If this is God's word, if this is the word of God, this is something to consider. If any man that's wide enough to have a message to Ralph Barnard than to you, if any man, get who he is, to love not the Lord Jesus Christ. At the coming of the Lord, that man shall be accursed. This text suggests three questions to me that I hope the Lord will help me to ask and answer in your hearing. The first question suggested by this text is this. What is the love that one must have in his heart toward the Lord Jesus Christ or at his coming experience separation from God be cast away into the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone? Before I attempt to give what I believe is the Bible answer to that question, what kind of love toward the Lord must I have if I hope not to be accursed by it, to be damned by it at his coming? I want to suggest something of the tremendous importance of that expression, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ. Not to love him. And I say again, not like this generation of church members. Just get something out of it. Always bragging about what he's done for you. Wouldn't know the Lord if you met you in the road. If you don't love him, not for anything he's done for you, but him, who he is. You're not saved, you know. All oh, this testimony made, I praise the Lord, he did this and he did this for me. You don't know about salvation. You got to love the Lord, not what he does for you. Doesn't say if any man doesn't love what the Lord does for people. Says if any man love not the Lord, Jesus Christ. At his coming he'll be accursed. Not to love the Lord means high rebellion against the highest throne in the universe, the throne of God upon which Jesus Christ now sits. God in time past spoke to us through his Father, through our fathers hath in these last days spoken in a son. That's his last word. This is the son of my love said the Father at the baptism of Jesus Christ. This is the Son of my love in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Not to love this one, the last word from God, the Son of God's love, the one that God Almighty finds his joy 
and his satisfaction and pleasure in. The one in whom we are accepted. Uh, yeah, I'm talking about accepting Jesus until I want to vomit. The good word would be, have, have I been accepted in the beloved one? That's Bible language. No acceptance for the only man that's ever lived yet. The father could find joy in and rest in and peace in as he looked at him as his son. And that's the reason there's no salvation apart from being put in Christ. And Christ put in you the hope of glory. Not to love him is the highest rebellion against the highest throne in the universe. Can we set aside this word from God? No, sir. The very essence of all sin is arrogance. It's setting up the little puppet God of self on the throne of our hearts instead of the rightful ruler, the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody on God's earth got a right to rule your life except Christ. You haven't got it. You forfeited it in Adam. There is no New Testament salvation without total submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. The essence of salvation is the collapse of the regime of self and the enthronement of Jesus Christ as Lord. What they call the gospel today, this empty, easy believism, is little more than acceptance of truth, which still leaves men and women uncommitted when truth is applied to life. Well, you got all those terms. He's saved, but he isn't consecrated. He's saved, but he isn't living right. He's saved, but he isn't separated. All that junk, you know, that you boys tell folks. Better cut it out. Man isn't saved unless he's committed to the Lord and his word. I'm not preaching the deeper life or the victorious life. I don't believe in those things. Maybe you do. But I am preaching the gateway to life. Here it is at the cross where self is crucified and Jesus Christ is enthroned. That's salvation. All of these movements we've got to try to improve on God's salvation are not of God. You can't improve on salvation. That's it. For salvation is Christ. And if you have Christ, you've got all that God. He hasn't got anything for people except Christ. Every good and perfect gift comes from him above. But it's all in Christ. All the love God has is in Christ. All the holiness God has is in Christ. Everything's in Christ. We had salvation plus something, brother. What we need to do is go to preaching the gospel, the full gospel, and that's for preaching the whole Christ. Then we won't have to have all of these deeper life, victorious life, Keswick movements and all of that that have occupied professing Christians so all on earth they good for us to wrap their righteous robes around themselves and try to improve the flesh. Let a world go to hell. What men and women need is to come to the cross and die in the cell and throne Jesus Christ as Lord. That ain't the deeper life. That's a salvation. It's a salvation. There is no salvation apart from what I'm talking about, the road to hell is more than skid row, the drunkards and adulterers, the road to hell may be the path you are walking on that brings you into church membership without self having been dethroned. It was by submission to his Father's will that the Lord Jesus Christ won the right for us to step out of slavery into freedom. He was obedient unto his father up to the point of death, even the death of the cross. 
I came not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me. It caused total submission to Almighty God for the Lord Jesus Christ to win the right to be your Lord and Savior. His total submission to God from the throne he left to the cross on which he died won for believers the right of his life and his power and his faith and his purity. And yet there are those today who say, well, just believe and decide for Christ and that's all. But the word of God says, no, no, submit, yield, surrender. You cannot go into glory except you under the rule of one who won the right for you to enter heaven. It cost him absolute submission to God to win. It'll cost you absolute submission to Christ to be saved. That's how much it costs. All on God, that's going to cost you, honey, if you ever get saved. It's just going to cost you the death of self and the enthronement of Jesus Christ. And that'll have to be done again tomorrow. You'll have to learn to die daily and crown Jesus Christ Lord daily. Amen. I'm talking sense to you tonight. Don't go to hell trusting your little old decision and your profession when you are still on the throne and you decide what you do and you decide what you love and you decide everything. You lost your right to decide. Nobody got a right to decide for you except him. The ABCs of God's eternal salvation are first. Acceptance of the sovereign rule of Jesus Christ in your life. B. Enjoying the blessings of the salvation he purchased with his blood. And C. Having Live a, live a life where you are being formed in it, where there is being formed in you the very character of the Lord Jesus Christ, where you'll not be plumb saved, but you're just exactly like Christ. And the man or woman who isn't being conformed daily to the express image of Jesus Christ, you're more like Christ today than you were yesterday. You miss Christ. You don't know him. You're going to hell. And when he comes, you'll be a curse. God means business. Everybody he says, he, he says, I'm going to make them exactly like Christ. And if he's not making you like Christ, you don't know him. Is that right? That's right. Now to a definite, precise answer to my first question. What is the love that I must have in my heart toward the Lord Jesus Christ if when he comes I shall not be accursed but shall be blessed. Here it is. We must find Jesus in his office work and he is on the job as a supreme complacency and satisfaction and joy and rest and pleasure of our life. We must find as we look from day to day, as Paul says, Christian does. Second Corinthians three eighteen. We must find the greatest complacency, satisfaction joy, pleasure, rest in looking at Jesus Christ on the job in his office work. We must find our satisfaction in his person as he performs his job. God gave him a job to do this. Came not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. 
Now, my friends, it is entirely possible, and I believe this is true, 95% of church members today, they're not hypocrites, they're earnest. They find satisfaction in the Lord Jesus, but they don't like him on the job. If there's a way to accept Christ apart from the work that the Father gave him to do, that he's working at now, I think we could win everybody in Lynchburg to Christ tomorrow. We can save and draw back from Jesus Christ on the job. But we must find the chief joy of our life, the chief rest and peace of our life, the supreme complacency and satisfaction of our life, more than mother, children, job, church, anything on God's earth. If anything gives you more joy or as much, just your daily contemplation of the Lord Jesus Christ as he's working, at the job the Father sent him to do. Anything on God's earth gives you more joy or as much joy as that. You miss Christ. Miss Christ. We must find our supreme delight, our supreme joy in the Lord Jesus Christ at work, working on the job. We must come to agree with Almighty God's verdict. This is the Son of my love, in whom I am well pleased. Are you well pleased with the Lord Jesus Christ as he's now working at the job the Father's given him? Father said, I'm well pleased, are you? And this here is where you get your chief joy. If your children give you more delight than I'm talking about or as much, you are lost. If your wife gives you more delight or as much as what I'm talking about now, you don't know the Lord. This must be it, brother. He will not share your affection with anybody. This must be supreme. This must be supreme. Now, we have certain things in life where we find, we, in which we find a complacency, a rest, a satisfaction. We find satisfaction just thinking about America, thinking about our home, thinking about our job. Thinking about our friends, we like to think about. It. Thinking about our recreations. Work five days a week, and if you have some recreation, even the boy, be glad when Saturday comes, and I will do whatever, you know, give you a little recreation. That's wholesome. We couldn't live if we didn't have some things that bring us joy. See what I mean? But Jesus Christ, on the job, must bring us our chief joy, our chief rest, our chief satisfaction. Now, the word love looks in two different directions. There's what the theologians call benevolent love. Benevolent. The volent means will, and the bene means good. It so simply means the love of goodwill. For instance, he has a drunkard, and you may love him with a benevolent love. You pity him. You love to see him safe. But you do not find any joy in thinking about it. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? You like to help him, and you can love him in that sense that you pity him. It's 
sorry for him. You would do him good. You have goodwill toward him. I could speak of the fact that in that sense God loves every sinner. In that he pities them. And that he sincerely desires their salvation. For God sincerely desires. He hasn't decreed. But he sincerely desires that all men should be saved. Maybe a little too deep, but that's so. God has desire expressed in the gospel. God has the will of command expressed in the law. He suffers it to be defeated, for he commands people in the law, and they, they don't keep it. He desires in the gospel that all men be saved, but they don't respond. But thank God he's decreed that some men shall be saved. If he didn't, nobody would be. But you may say that God, Matthew chapter 5, tells us we may join God if we would be perfect and prove ourselves to be children of our Heavenly Father, Matthew chapter 5. 43, 4, verse 46. We may have the same attitude. God, in that sense, would do good toward all men. In that sense, God loves all men. For he causes the rain to come on the just and the unjust, and the sun to shine on the good and the evil. So you may have that benevolent love toward the drunkard of the heart or the deceit for somebody. But you don't think about them with great joy, do you? You wouldn't say, this is my drunkard friend in whom I'm well pleased. You don't find satisfaction there. Neither does God. One of the silliest things I ever hear to put down the land is that God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. That's just downright silly because the sin cannot exist apart from the one who commits it. And while God has a love of benevolence, he pities that sinner in his sins. He doesn't look on him with complacency and says, Behold that sinner, I sure like to look at him. I find my joy and my peace and my rest and my satisfaction in that old guy out there blowing the smoke of his unbelief in my nostrils and shaking his fist in my face. No, God doesn't find any peace and joy in rebellious sin. But when you come to loving the Lord Jesus Christ, you got to love him with a benevolent love. He doesn't need your pity. He's enthroned. You don't need to pity him, do you? You don't need to wish him well. He's enthroned. Amen. You don't need to wish you could help him out. He's on the throne. He's on the throne. Oh, my soul. We love him. Not with pity. Not because we're sorry for it. Not because we want to help him out. But the love that we must have for him is not the love of goodwill to him. But it's the love of complacency as we contemplate him in his office word. We find their rest and peace and joy and satisfaction in him. Now, this must be supreme. In Matthew chapter 10, the Lord said, If you love father and mother more than me, you're not worthy. This is supreme. Tomorrow night, we're going to bring you 12 claims the Lord made when he is here. Every one of them. Brandon is the world's biggest monster or God Almighty. There's no halfway measures. He's either Almighty God's son and the son. Or he's the worst blasphemer and the most terrible monster this world ever knew. He's not good man if he's not God. He's a, he's a liar and everything else. Or he's God. I'm telling you, when you look swell in the face of the claims of Jesus Christ, you've got to cut 
starve and hope to die. Or thou at his soul. And I look you in the face, my friends, when I meet you at the judgment, I'll remember that I said it with all the force there is in my soul, that you must find your supreme joy and satisfaction in Jesus Christ and nowhere else. It's mean more to you than family and church or anything on God's earth if it doesn't can't be his disciple. He demands, he, man, isn't that something? Man? He said, you must love me more than you do your wife. You don't ought to send you to the classroom. When I come, I'll, I'll curse you. Cast you into the fire. For a mere man to make a claim like that, friends him as a monster or a fool. He's either a fool or a monster. For he's the God of the universe. No halfway measure to it. Now, my friends, we might be just tickled to death with Jesus in his person. He's such a nice fellow. He, uh, he called little children to him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of God. And he didn't, he, he didn't even step on a vial, you know. He was so gentle. With everybody except the religious people. And uh, he's such a nice person. His teachings are nice and sweet. But oh, when we look at him on the job, some people just will not come to him as he's working. At the job, not in. May I illustrate? There's a priest to offer sacrifice, become a substitute for sin. And unless you can get to the place where you find great joy and peace, satisfaction, and rest, just for holding him. In the eyes of God, he's always hung on that cross. He was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He's still hanging there in that sense. I'm looking you in the face. I don't care how many decisions you've made, how many professions of faith you've made, unless you find your great joy. Just thinking about it, contemplating it, and resting on him. Performing his work, brother, as a priest, hanging on that bloody cross, on that bloody cross. Oh, he suffered, bled, and died. Paul will go down to Corinth and say, We determined not to know anything about you, save Jesus Christ, the one having been crucified. The one who's now alive, but the one who bears in his own body the print of the nail, um, carries the power of his blood. We still tell men to lay hold of and to look at that bloody person. Pilate had him beaten until Isaiah says his visage was so marred that he didn't look like a human being. Pressed a crown of thorns on his head, gave him a cross to bear up the hill. Nail and trust, gave him gall, vinegar, and wormwood to drink. Shot dice for his garments, hooted and cheered, and made fun of him in his nakedness. That's a miracle of grace has come where you see not only the brutality of men, the awfulness of the Lord God. If you find great joy in looking at him hanging there, you're not saved. You're just an unsaved church member going your religious road to hell. When 
unless you can see him yonder with eyes of faith, performing his work as our great high priest. Oh, what joy. If any man I write these things unto you, that you sin not, I can't get in that door. Just me now. But if any man sin, I'd get in there. You know what says we have? We have an advocate. Oh, he's able to save to the uttermost. Keep old Ross saved. Everyone who comes under God by him. Why? See, and he does whatever liveth to make an incision. What a rest and peace and joy and satisfaction to behold him hanging on a cross and now at the right hand of God is my intercessor, is my everything. Thank God. Pray for me. Pray for me. Oh, with my sin and my guilt and with my smitten conscience, I can look at that man hanging on a cross. Body torn, heart torn open and exposed to the nature of the gaze of those malicious people. And I know that him hanging there saying to a word, when God takes a man in judge, but every eye will be dotted and every T of the cross will be crawled, of the, of the law will be crossed. Man will suffer the awful penalty of the broken law at the hands of a holy God. But in all of my guilt and my sin and my smitten conscience, thank God, I look at him hanging on a cross and I see the mercy of God. And I see forgiveness of sin. And I see a pardon over. And I can keep singing, Dear thy lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power. Till all the ransomed church of God is saved to sin no more. And I can sing, When I survey that wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died. Do you find joy in the Lord working at his office, hanging on a cross? The cross is forever in the heart of God. He was as a lamb slain. And he's the crucified one. But I cannot take it out of his job unless I come to that cross. And S-E-L-F self dies there. I cannot whittle him out there. I can't take him off his job. I can't whittle him away. Do we not in baptism say, as we go down in the water, that by faith we plunged our soul into the blood of the cross. Do we not, when we come to the Lord's Supper, say that as we eat this wafer and drink this wine, we find it delightful day by day to eat Christ's flesh and drink his blood. Then I want you to see it at work. Where is he now? See him hanging on a cross forever in the heart of God. See him wherefore God hath highly exalted him. He sat down at the right hand of God on a throne forever. Lest you come to the place you find great joy, satisfaction, peace, and rest. By looking at him, where is it? On the throne. 
unless it brings you great joy that you're absolutely in his hands. He must control you. And you're glad. You're glad he's on the throne, not yourself. Amen. You know, he's God's prime minister. According to the Bible, God's turned everything over to him. And the Lord Jesus Christ is going to carry out everything God purposed. And bless God, he's not sitting on that throne by your permission. He's sitting on it by God Almighty's act. God sitting down on that throne. And he's Lord. Whether you like it or not, he's Lord. He's the enthroned Lord of the universe, Lord of all mankind. Whether you ever bow to him or not, you'll bow to him when as your judge he makes you and sends you to hell. And as he sits down on that throne, you cannot whittle him down. I might say I like Jack Kennedy, but I don't like him to be commander in chief of the army. But he is commander in chief of the army. I might say I like Jack Kennedy, but I don't like him to be the executor of the laws of America. He just sent troops down to Birmingham, Alabama, my home state, because he's exercising, he's executing the law of the land. See, I don't like him to have the execution of the law in his hand, but he has, whether I like it or not. I say I like Jesus Christ. But I don't like him to be the commander-in-chief of this world and of me and the devil and everybody else. But he is. The devil can't weaken eyelash without the permission of the Lord of glory. He's the commander-in-chief. The Father's turned everything over to him. All authority has been given him. Who gave it to him? The Father. Thou hast given him authority over all flesh. He's Khrushchev's Lord. He's Kennedy's Lord. He's your Lord. As your Lord, he can save you or he can send you to hell. He bought you with his blood. He's going to do one or two things. I'm going to save you by his grace or damn you to eternal hell. See, I don't like that. You can't help it. You can't have hell. Except you'll have him as he's working. He's working right now, brother. He's ruling this world from his throne. Now, when he was here, he was a preacher. He was a prophet. And notice carefully two things. When he preached, he preached himself. See, God hadn't any message except Christ. And, the, and Christ, when he was preaching, couldn't preach anything except Christ. Nothing else preached. And he preached himself as the priest. He said, except you eat this flesh, drink this blood, you have no life in you. Pointed to his priestly work on the cross. But he didn't preach his lordship, he demonstrated it. That's a good way to do. If you're a lawyer and you move to Lynchburg, best thing to do is set up your office, put out a shingle, and try a few cases. Demonstrate whether you're actually a lawyer or not. If you're a carpenter, move to town and build a few houses. You might say, well, we'll hire him to build one. Best way to advertise yourself is not to talk, but to act in that right. And so the Lord didn't preach his lordship. He demonstrated in the 18th chapter of John. I'll not take time to read it, but you read it. The old Pilate comes to Christ when they brought him before him. He says, you king, are you in rebellion against the Roman Empire? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. But Pilate, he came back again. He said, I want you to ask me a question. Are you a king? And he said, thou saidst it for this end. 
How did he demonstrate his lordship? How complete is it? Oh, bless God. The waves, surging waves. He speaks! And the sea is gone. He comes to Lazarus too. He's been dead four days so that his body's corrupted. He speaks! Everything happens at the word! Of Jesus Christ. All hell cannot withstand his word. He speaks. I think he uses means, doctors, and so forth. And arrest disease. If any man's healed of any sickness, unquit through prayer, doctors, or hospitals. Is by the grace of God. He speaks. And men dead in their sins of given life. Nothing can be left undisturbed. By the word of when the, when the Lord speaks. He speaks and demons come out of men. Say, we know who thou art, thou holy one of Israel. He holds death in his hands. I'm as certain as I'm alive today. I'm going to live until God takes a hand in it. He's the Lord of death. You say, I believe that, but I don't believe he holds the reins of men's hearts. In his hands, how about old Levi? He's sitting at the seat of custom, robbing the people of the money. Still in his sins, and Jesus came and said, follow me. He comes to Peter, James, and John, and he says, come on! And they leave their nets and follow him. He was a man, but a man as I am, apart from sin. As a man, he wept at the grave of Lazarus. You would, as a human, weep when you enter a house of death. He was a man, and as a preacher, man, but he was a preacher when he was here. You know, preached himself. He looked over the holy city of Jerusalem and wept, like Brother Lynch. Brother Holly, some part of every day of your life, surely, you draw a sigh and weep over each word. Like John Knox would weep and cry, give me Scott and all. But although he was as much a man as you are, apart from sin, he's more. Is Almighty God, and His word was effectual. He speaks. Levi leaves his custom seat and follows Christ. He speaks. Zacchaeus slides down out of a sycamore tree, takes Jesus home with him. He speaks. And Saul of Tarsus is arrested from his mad career of killing Christians. He speaks. Now from a throne, if men and women accept him, they must accept him on a throne. He's there. Bow to him. You'll bow to his master. Masterhood of your life, you'll bow to his rule. You'll bow to his lordship. Now I trust that you learn to trust him. Not perfectly. But I sure am glad he's on the throne. I look out at the future. All hell busted. Communism growing. Ten times more missionaries in Africa preaching Mohammedanism than the gospel of Christ. Ism growing. All hell popping. Nobody knows what a day will bring forth. 
I'm glad Jesus Christ is sitting on the floor. And I find joy, peace that the future's in his hands. I kind of got scared the other day. The various preachers America's ever produced, dear brother, he said, a bit of and took God used it. He's a way preaching for somebody. Raven's home. Died like that. I thought about the old Dr. Ironside. Died where we are in Australia. I'm away from my home so much, sometimes I get a little scared. I hope the Lord let me die at home, I don't quite know. But praise God, I'm glad the future's in his hands. I get a lot of kick out of that. Do you? You cannot whittle it down. You've got to take it. On that bloody cross, where he poured his soul out, you got to die to yourself. And you got to receive him on the throne. Amen. You're the boss from now on, Lord. Brother Holly, this isn't something in addition to salvation. This is it. I'm not preaching the thief for life or consecration or rededication. All that stuff silly. I'm just presenting to you Christ at work, hanging on the cross, at the right hand of God, making intercession for his people and ruling this whole world. Huh? That's reading I've been going up down this country. In my way, I've been awful ineffective, made a lot of mistakes, but I've been telling men, you need to be born again. You need God to show mercy to you. No man is going to bow to the Lord Jesus Christ without an operation of the Holy Spirit. You can accept your little Jesus and go to hell without God's Spirit, but you can't bow. No man can call Jesus Lord. I'm quoting the scripture except for the Holy Ghost. My second question, very quickly, why is this love finding my supreme joy and peace and delight in Jesus Christ on the job, hanging on a cross, and sitting on God's throne? Why is this love essential? Very quickly, it's essential for four reasons. First, it'll be the occupation of heaven, loving the Lord, beholding the Lord. The Bible teaches we'll do two things in heaven. We'll serve him and we'll look on his face. That's all there is to it down here. And you're going to have to learn how to, to behold him and get joy. That's all you do in heaven, just beholding his face, just looking on his face and serving him. You're going to have to get used to beholding his face and finding joy and pleasure and satisfaction. Huh? Down here. Amen. That's right. That's right. Not tomorrow. Today. You don't have it tomorrow that you learn to find your chief joy in him. You don't have it tomorrow. This may be your last opportunity. Unless you've learned what I'm talking about, you never have repented. For repentance means turning to from turning from anything that will keep you from it to the Lord God. There are just three things that will keep a man from turning from sin to the Lord, and that's self-righteousness. Think you're all right. I'm all right. Or rebellion. Just not going to reign in my life. Huh? Or love of sin. Big sin, little sin, any sin. If it keeps you from turning from to Almighty God to lay hold on Him, it'll damn your soul. God help you if you sign a peace treaty with any sin. You got me talking? 
you sign a peace treaty with a little bit of sin you're going to do. You preach in perfection. Yes, the Bible teaches it, not in this life. But if you are engaging in any known sin, you're comfortable in it, you're going to hell. It's the sure that I'm preaching to you now. You can't sign a peace treaty with sin and be a child of God. You fall, you fall into sin, you stumble, but you never make a treaty of peace with it. Besides, we we'll live together. You ever talk it? I try. You never have repented. You don't know what I'm talking about now. Third reason this love is essential is that faith is not alone. We are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saved is not alone. It includes repentance, turning from all known sin. It includes confession by the way you live of the Lord Jesus Christ. Testimony is one thing. It may be true or false. Testimony is this. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. That's my testimony. may be true, may be false. Confession is always true. You confess it by the way you live. You better get that through. You confess it by the way you live. You testify, that's one thing. I know that's so or not. But you confess it by the way you live. Faith includes repentance and confession and love of Christ. The fourth reason this love is essential is that vital union with Christ is essential. You must be actually married to him or you have no interest in his blood. There must be spiritual wedlock with him on the cross and on the throne that so that he's a part of you and you're a part of him and that's hard affection. You actually, this is Brother Mark, you actually love him with all your heart and your mind and your soul and your love. Be awful for a man and wife to live together in wedlock unless they love each other. There's no sense thinking you and Christ being joined apart from Him loving you. You respond in that He is above by loving Him. We love Him, the Scripture says, why? Because He first 